Good morning, DEA. Wanted to read a story to you today called Wilma Unlimited. And this is about how Wilma Rudolph became the world's fastest woman. So here's our front cover. It is written by Kathleen Krull and illustrated by David Diaz. As you can see behind me, I have locomotor skills. They are listed backwards. I'm going to take a picture below <laughs> so you don't have to read it backwards. But we do have some terms you'll hear in the book. Walk, run, hop, jump, and skip. And to walk simply means using hill ball toe of your foot. To run, you are walking but at a faster cadence. Hop, using one foot to go momentarily up in the air. Jump, using two feet to go momentarily up in the air. And skip being a combination of step, hop, step, hop, step, hop. So you will hear, listen for those locomotor PE vocabulary terms throughout our book. All right, here we go. No one expected such a tiny girl to have a first birthday. In Clarksville, Tennessee, in 1940, life for a baby who weighed just over four pounds at birth was sure to be limited. But most babies didn't have 19 older brothers and sisters to watch over them. Most babies didn't have a mother who knew home remedies and a father who worked several jobs. Most babies weren't Wilma Rudolph. Here's our first pictures. The pictures here, the artwork from the illustration is beautiful in this book. These different types of painting, I talked to Miss Ray, they use acrylics, watercolor, and gouache. So if you have more questions on the specific type of artwork, feel free to reach out to Miss Ray. But you can go through and count. There are actually 19 kids in this picture. If you want to pause it, go and count, because I definitely counted. <laughs> Wilma did celebrate her first birthday, and everyone noticed that as soon as this girl could walk, she ran or jumped instead. Walk, run, and jump. She worried people, though. She was always so small and sickly. If a brother or sister had a cold, she got double pneumonia. If one of them had measles, Wilma got measles, too, plus mumps and chicken pox. Her mother always nursed her at home. Doctors were a luxury for the Rudolph family. And anyway, only one doctor in Clarksville would treat black people. Here is Obama, right here. Just before she turned five, she got sicker than ever. Her sisters and brothers heaped all the family blanket on her, trying to keep her warm. During that sickness, Wilma's left leg twisted inward, so it twisted inward, and she couldn't move it back. Not even Wilma's mother knew what was wrong. The doctor came to see her then. Besides scarlet fever, he said, Wilma had also been stricken with polio. In those days, most children who got polio either died or were permanently crippled. There was no cure. The news spread around Clarksville. Wilma, that lively girl, would never walk again. This is a picture of her sick in the bed, the doctor finally coming to her aid. But Wilma kept moving any way she could by hopping on one foot. She could get herself around the house, to the outhouse in the backyard, and even on Sundays to church. Wilma's mother urged her on. Mrs. Rudolph had plenty to do. The cooking, the cleaning, sewing patterned flower sacks onto clothes for her children. Now, 22 in all. So there were 19 children. Now they're 22. So a lot of babies. Yet twice every week, she and Wilma took the bus to the nearest hospital that would treat the black patients some 50 miles away in Nashville. Remember, we're in Tennessee. They rode together in the back, the only place blacks were allowed to sit. Doctors and nurses at the hospital helped Wilma do exercises to make her paralyzed legs stronger at home. Wilma practiced them constantly, even when it hurt. So she went to the doctors to help her as a form of rehabilitation. So when her leg was turning inward towards her body to help it straighten out. Here's a picture of them on the bus right there. To Wilma, what hurt, what hurt most was that the local school wouldn't let her attend because she couldn't walk. 
Tearful and lonely, she watched her brothers and sisters run off to school each day, leaving her behind. Finally, tired of crying all the time, she decided she had to fight back somehow. I wonder what she's planning on doing. You can see Wilma sitting here, looking at her brother and sisters right there. Some wistful longing. Make a prediction. What do you think is going to happen? Wilma worked so hard at her exercises that the doctor decided she was ready for a heavy steel brace. With the brace supporting her leg, she didn't have to hop, hop anymore. School was possible at last, but it wasn't the happy place she had imagined. Her classmates made fun of her brace. During playground games, she could only sit on the sidelines, twitchy with impatience. She studied the other kids for hours, memorizing their moves, watching the ball zoom through the rim of a bushel basket they used as a hoop. So almost sort of like a waste basket or a trash can, they were using that as a basketball hoop. Wilma fought the sadness by doing more leg exercises. Her family always cheered her on, and Wilma did everything she could to keep them from worrying about her. At times, her leg really did seem to be getting stronger. Other times, it just hurt. So you can see she's sitting and watching. So this is the leg brace. This is what they were talking about. It's keeping it straight. So instead of it turning inward to her body, it's keeping it for the front. One Sunday on her way to church, Wilma felt especially good. She and her family had always found strength in their faith, and church was Wilma's favorite place in the world. Everyone knew she would be there, talking and laughing, praying and singing. It would be just the place to try the bravest thing she had ever done. She hung back while people filled the old building. Standing alone, the sound of hymns colored the air. She unbuckled her heavy brace and set it by the church's front door. Taking a deep breath, she moved one foot in front of the other, her knees trembling violently. She took her mind off her knee by concentrating on taking another breath and then another. So look, here she is. She's taking the brace off. She's about to walk up the aisle all by herself without her brace. Here is two pictures. As you can see, there's the visual. Look, everybody's looking like, what is she doing? No one's ever seen her walk without her brace since she was sick. Whispers rippled throughout the gathering. Wilma Rudolph was walking row by row, heads turned, turning towards her as she walked alone down the aisle. Her large family, all her family's friends, everyone from school, each person stared wide-eyed. The singing never stopped. It seemed to burst right through the walls and into the trees. Finally, Wilma reached a seat in the front and began singing to her smile triumphant. So she's made it all the way to the front. She's walking all like, oh, I got this. Now let's see at the front. She practiced walking as often as she could after that. And when she was 12 years old, she was able to take off the brace for good. Ah. She and her mother realized she could get along without it. So one memorable day, they wrapped the hated brace in a box and mailed it back to the hospital. As soon as Wilma sent the box away, she knew her life was beginning all over again. So here they are, packing the brace in the box. And it, it's kind of hard to see, but it says fragile. They're sending it back to the hospital. After years of sitting on the sidelines, Wilma couldn't wait to throw herself into basketball. Team sport basketball. The game she had most liked to watch. She was skinny, but no longer tiny. Her long, long legs would propel her across the court, would push her forward and through the air. And she knew all the rules and all the moves. In high school, she led her basketball team to one victory after another. Eventually, she took them all the way to the Tennessee State Championships. Then, to everyone's astonishment, her team actually lost. Here's a picture of them playing basketball. Wilma had become accustomed to winning. Now she slumped on the bench, all the liveliness knocked out of her. But at the game that day was a college coach. He admired Wilma's basketball playing, but was especially impressed by the way she ran. 
He wanted her for his track and field team, another sport. With this help, Wilma won a full athletic scholarship to Tennessee State University. That means you do not have to pay any money. This, the, you, this, the university is paying her way to go to college and to be on the track and field team. She was the first member of her family to go to college. So here you can see the man that was sitting there. She was all sad, but he was looking at her for a completely different um, skill set. Eight years after she mailed her brace away, Wilma's long legs and years of hard work carried her thousands of miles from Clarksville, Tennessee. The summer of 1960, she arrived in Rome, Italy, to represent, well, represent the United States at the Olympic Games as a runner. Just participating in the Olympics was a deeply personal victory for Wilma, but her chances of winning the race were very limited. Simply walking in Rome's shimmering heat was a chore, and athletes from other countries had run faster races than Wilma ever had. Women weren't thought to run very well. Anyway, track and field was considered a sport for men, and the pressure from the public was intense. For the first time ever, the Olympics would be shown on television, TV, and all athletes knew that more than 100 million people would be watching. Worst of all, Wilma had twisted her ankle just after she arrived in Rome. It was still swollen and painful on the day of her first race. So not only was she going through all these different factors, she also had an injury. Oh, here's the picture. Spin down, looks like she's trying to brace her ankle. Yet once it was her turn to compete, Wilma forgot her ankle and everything else. She lunged forward, not thinking about her fear, her pain, or the sweat flying off her face. She ran better than she ever had before, and she ran better than anyone else. Grabbing the attention of the whole world, Wilma Rudolph of the United States won the 100-meter dash. No one else even came close. An Olympic gold medal was hers to take home. Here's the picture. Recognize it. Front cover, hey, hey. So she has one gold medal for the 100 meter dash so far. So when it was time for the 200 meter dash, Wilma's graceful long legs were already famous. Her ears buzzed with the sound of the crowd chanting her name. So the crowd's going, Wilma, Wilma, Wilma. Such support helped her ignore the rain that was beginning to fall. At the crack of the starting gun, she surged into humid air like a tornado. It's a good sentence. When she crossed the finish line, she had done it again. She finished far ahead of everyone else. She had earned her second gold medal. Wet and breathless, Wilma was exhilarated by the double triumph. The crowd went wild. They cheered for her. The 400-meter relay race was yet to come. Wilma's team faced the toughest competition of all. And as the fourth and final runner on her team, it was Wilma who had to cross the finish line. So here's this picture. So, so far, even though she's the underdog, she has won gold medal on the 100 meter dash. She has won first place gold medal on the 200 meter dash. Now her third event is a 400 meter and it's not one person, it is a team. They're gonna use a baton we'll talk about in a minute. And each member has to pass the baton towards the next member. And then that member runs forward. Here is the picture of what I was just trying to say. So as you can see, running, 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 and that's the baton, kind of like a stick, and they're passing it to the next person who then takes off to keep running. And this picture is so pretty. I like this picture. Will this teammate ran running on our board? They ran well, passed the baton smoothly, and kept the team in first place. Wilma readied herself for the dash to the finish line as her third teammate ran toward her. She reached back for the baton and nearly dropped it. As she tried to recover from the fumble, two other runners sped past her. Wilma and her team were suddenly in third place. Ever since the day she had walked down the aisle at church, Wilma had known the power of concentration. Now, legs pumping. She put her mind to work. In a final electrifying burst of speed, she pulled ahead. By a fraction of a second, she was the first to blast across the finish line. 
The thundering cheers match the thundering of her own heart. She had made history. She had won for an astounding third time. This is a huge moment. She has now won three gold medals. At her third ceremony that week, as the band played, the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, Wilma stood tall and still, like a queen, the last of her three Olympic gold medals hanging around her neck. Wilma Rudolph, once known as the sickliest child in Clarksville, had become the fastest woman in the world. And that is the last page of our story. So I really love this book today. I thought there were a lot of underlying themes, but most importantly, it is backwards, and I'll take a picture of it also. Ah! So when I was reading this story, it really reminded me of the word resilience. And resilience just means the ability to recover from setbacks or difficulties. So think about the different ways that Wilma was resilient in the story. Apply it to your everyday life. I mean, you just think about myself. We all know I'm recovering from the facial injury. So ways I had to practice resilience and going back to work, trying to get back in my everyday routines, you know, trying to recover from a setback on my face. So think about how this applies to online learning your everyday life and look forward to talking again with you guys soon.